And a very good morning to you. Welcome along to Tuesday Mornings Off The Ball AM. And what a show we have for you today. We're going to be talking about Punchestown, where the two greatest Irish trainers of the generation are squaring off in a battle to the death at the end of the week to see who can win the uh, trainer's title. John Duggan's going to join us a little bit later on to preview the first day of the Punchestown Festival. Of course, it's Liverpool against Roma, which is dominating the back pages tonight. We'll talk about that game a little bit later on. We're going to hear from two... Liverpool striking legends, both Ian Rush and Michael Owen, have done feature interviews with us here on Off the Ball in recent days, so we'll get their thoughts ahead of the game as well. And loads more besides, including Cleena Foley. Good morning to you, Cleena. Good morning. How are you? I'm good, thank you. A little early. Um, I've just seen this headline Ian Wright's 7 million memorabilia hall sold off after ex wife failed to keep up with storage payments. I didn't see the 7 million figure until right this second. <laughs> I thought it was like a few posters and a pair of boots. Yeah, and I, well, I, I just immediately my thought was, why does she have to do the payments? Well, and also, why why is it worth seven million quid? <laughs> is that what she got very, in the divorce? Very, very expensive storage, whatever happened there. Yeah, I mean, uh, how much tat do you need for it to be worth seven million? <laughs> oh, yeah, exactly. He just needed somebody to go in and do a good clear out. There's a lot of uh, those, what, those hoarding programmes that I never quite watch enough to know the names of on TV. Yeah, I wondered as well, like, yeah, exactly, why would you keep all that stuff? But he has, he was always clearly a very sentimental guy, wasn't he? The one I always, the one thing I liked about Wright was when he always said about, he used to give back his money, his expenses for playing for England because he said it was, it was a, all right. it was a privilege. And that made me like him, actually. Yeah, yeah. He, used, he, used to, he used to like him. Then when he said that, I thought, well, that's fair juice. So maybe it was all his English memorabilia, he just couldn't give it away. Yeah, I mean, it's a lot of stuff. <laughs> and, like, he had a good career, right? A good career. Not like an all-time great, super stratospheric, like four Champions Leagues and a Golden Boot or anything. Yes. Well, I wonder what it was that actually was worth <laughs> What was in there? Years. Yeah, if anybody, <laughs> if anybody can uh, fill us in on the details of that. We're also going to talk about uh, a bunch of other stuff that are making our OTB AM Tuesday morning breakfast menu. That's coming for you in a little while. But first, let's bring you through the newspapers. OTB AM. In association with AIR. Get AIR Sport Free with AIR Broadband. It is literally the same picture of Mohamed Salah in uh, different sizes on the back page of every single newspaper today. It's him pointing his finger at the camera ahead of this game against Roma tonight. Salah to take aim at old Roma friends is the headline on the back of the Irish Independent this morning. Uh, Munster Academy to lessen numbers in major restructuring is a really interesting story from Keen Tracy at the bottom of that, that uh, less is more for the Munster Academy. They're cutting down the number of people that they're going to work with in a bid to try and get more of the players actually through the pathway to the senior team. And there's also an interesting story there about Carlo being hit by Brendan Murphy deciding that he's going to spend the summer in the USA playing Gaelic football. This is one of those stories that, it's funny, the GPA get hammered for raising money in America and they get accused of fishing in the same pot as uh, local GAA in... that It's the same bunch of people yeah, who are... Yeah, papers. giving out the money. But massive amounts of money are spent on bringing Irish players over to America to play ball in the summer. And it's like, well, sure, that's grand. Yeah, and it, that has existed for, as time immemorial, and they've changed the rules so many times to try and stop people going. Um, but when it happens in a county, I think, like Carlo, you know, and you have a marquee player like him and he goes, that's a big blow to them. And obviously they have had huge momentum off their division for uh, season in the league. So, it, like... I always feel sorry for, you know, there's counties that can sustain players going in the summer, but they definitely can't, you know, and Brendan Murphy is the fulcrum of that team, so. And they were so, they were the story of the summer last year in, in the early part of the summer with their run in the championship, and then they sustained that, and that yeah. so rarely happens. You, like, normally, these, they come out of nowhere, a team has a six-week period where everything clicks for them, and then they disappear again, but they and, literally built on it. And what surprises me, I suppose, is that a lot of their success has been built by Tarek O'Brien, the manager, creating this family, creating this, you know, pride pride in Carlo, Carlo, this hashtag Carlo rising, this notion of everyone rowing in behind the county. So I am surprised to see a player who's so central to them leaving when this sort of, you know, brothers in arms thing is there. So yeah. you can only presume the reason for it is financial um, and that's very often why players go because somebody offers them a job and they get good money over there as well. Um, but but it's a huge loss to them. It is. And I notice actually also um, Gordon Manning has in the, in the uh, Sun today um, Meath have lost five players since the end of the league, including uh, Sean Tobin, who'd be, you know, would be the bigger known player. And this is just around the time of year where these stories start breaking. Yeah. Where people, you know, we suddenly and because there has been this lull in the intercounty game, um, they're only starting to come out now. 
um, who's who's not going to be around this summer. But that's the first big news, really, of it. Yeah, and uh, look, it all goes back to the sustainability of the fixture system and um, is there any point in staying? And then there are also people who are just going to go because there's the opportunity to go and have a summer in America having the time of your life. Yeah, and you look at, uh, you know, it, it, it's always been that thing, like there was always that thing that people would go to America and there, were all, there are certain cities in America as well that always seem to have money to bring them as well. Um, but, but I'm just surprised at, at, at it happening now to Carlo because, as I said, they have this whole Band of Brothers thing going on and that's what really has helped them so greatly. Yeah, OK, so on to the Irish Examiner and they also have Mohamed Salah on the front. And their headline is, Use the Momentum Club wants pool to fire like Fergie's United. Um, and then obviously they have the continuing fallout from Munster's defeat at the top there. Room for improvement, Simon Lewis and where Munster are falling short in their quest for glory. Keith Earl's going to join us in the studio a little bit later on to uh, talk to us about some of the other stuff apart from the match itself. Um, and then Damien Comer has given a very un GAA interview where he says that, yeah, we could win the All-Ireland and actually the dubs are beatable. So fair play, I say, to Damien Comer for <laughs> telling the truth and not going, yeah, sure, we'll see what happens. We'll sure it'll be difficult for us to keep the ball kicked out to Dublin. Like, yeah, let's go toe-to-toe -to -toe and see what happens. Yeah, and um, I think it probably reflects, you know, um, how Galway feel. Uh, you know, they are definitely a team that are on the up. Um, they, showed they, had, they showed in the league they're not afraid of Dublin. And that, you're right, it's really refreshing to see someone yeah. come out and be honest and say it. Yeah, We have some confidence. Yeah, Imagine yeah. Imagine that. Yeah. <laughs> Young Irish people with confidence. <laughs> Well, well, he'll, he'll have his wings clipped fairly soon, no doubt. Well, that's the point, yes. So many managers seem to, you know, have them, you know, zip-lipped, say, don't say anything, whatever you say, don't say anything. Maybe it's just the fact that, you know, nothing has it has really started yet, you know. Isn't Galway the one county, though, where actually they like that little bit of swagger? I mean, that's my experience as a Kildare supporter of coming up against Galway, where they come from nowhere and it's like, no, we're, we're Galway, like, we're well, one yeah, of the greatest and, teams and, of all time. Well, yeah, and, and also they always, they always had this attacking flair, so if you think back even to people like John Donlan and Park Joyce, and people like that, Michael Donlan. Do you know what I mean? They, 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 their forwards, particularly, are those kind of players who yeah. just played with that kind of freedom. They didn't, they didn't collars really. Up. Yeah, collars up, exactly. Yeah. yeah, it's nice to see it, as you said. Yeah, different. No, totally. On to the uh, the Irish Times next, and um, again, Damien Comer makes the. Uh, so it's always hard to know exactly what the Irish Times are leading with. They're leading today with um, Donald McRae's brilliant interview with Jurgen Klopp. We'll talk about that a little bit later on as well, and then just the match preview from Andy Hunter in the Guardian. Um, really the expectation is that Liverpool are going to win this because it's Roma and it's not one of the European uh, heavyweights but they also have the um, Damien Comer story he was the PwC GPA Player of the Month and that's why he was doing that interview in football the hurler was Jason Ford so some Jason Ford interviews in the other pages where he's actually given out about social media being the reason that he ended up getting the ban last year. Yeah, I, I mean, I don't think social media was the reason for it, in fairness. Um, and he's very soft on Davy Fitz, uh, you know, in that on that instance. And yeah. saying, you know, it was kind of blown. You don't, you don't want to give yeah. Davy Fitz any, yeah, any ammunition I, for the dressing room wall. Yeah, but I, but I also, I don't think the CCCC judge on social media. I think they, they unfortunately, they, they usually go with where the TV live TV cameras are and what was caught on TV. Yeah. That's so the it's TV's fault. It was TV's fault, yeah, <laughs> not, yeah. not social media. And uh, here's a Declan Bogue story that is in The Examiner, in The Times and The Independent today. BBC viewers may miss out on most Ulster games. This is a really interesting story That's and it's part of the fallout from the advent of the Super 8s. One of the laws of unintended consequences. So there will be more big games this year but the same TV contracts will persist, yeah. which means that the TV companies have rights to a certain number of games. And so, having a brain, they've decided to wait until the games get good and meaningful to select their games, and so some of the early season games in, say, for example, the Ulster Championship won't now be shown on TV. Yeah, and that will be a big blow, I think, to a lot of people in Ulster because they do like to, I think they like to watch it, they like to see the coverage. And also, and it's, it's a strange thing, it seems... Uh, BBC provides the feed for RTE, so it's RTE. In other words, it's RTE's decision to concentrate on the Super 8s is going to mean that BBC won't actually be able to show. They're only showing, I think, two games in, yeah. the, in the Ulster Championship. The, the big one that won't be shown at the moment, unless um, something changes, is... is Tyrone Manon. Yeah, is that good one? game. Yeah, really good game. I mean, I'm really surprised that that won't. Could somebody else come in and take it? Could Sky or somebody maybe come in? Um, and we don't know, I mean... RT haven't said yet what games they're covering, but obviously he has a good tip here and that's a good story. Um, but maybe somebody else, it, it's, it just, does it leave room for somebody else to try and come in there that already have him? But again, Sky have 
only a certain number of games. Yeah, so if you're Sky, do you, do you waste it on an Ulster Championship game or do you hold it until it's actually... Say waste it on an Ulster Championship game. Spoken round, like a Kildare man. Final round of... Uh, <laughs> of um, you wouldn't think like that if you were Monaghan or Super Toronto. Eights. But then maybe, like, like I think Monaghan and Toronto will both be in the Super 8s. Yeah, yeah. And they could yeah. actually meet again. Yeah. So you could have the exact same game, the same venue, except it meeting a place in the All-Ireland semi-final or it just deciding who reaches, who has to play an extra one extra match in the qualifiers. Yeah, but I, and, but I just think in Ulster, people are very, uh, they're very much inclined to look for their local TV coverage of it though, so I think that will cause a stir. Um, is there a possibility that it means that more people actually go to the matches, that these games are all now sellouts? Yeah, and it's, and it is one of the arguments, isn't it, that, that, um, that so much live coverage has effect. I think it has affected the number of, and particularly if it's a bad day, or yeah. you know what I mean? Um, and it's costs. Cost, cost is a fact as well for families. So maybe, I mean, and I think even Pauly Duffy, for he, in se over several years, has, it looked to me as if he was trying to cut back at, at some point on the live coverage because it was affecting games yeah. in some provinces. I've no doubt it'll have full radio coverage. Yeah. <laughs> we'll see about that. Uh, all right, let's, where's next after the, uh, after the Times is The Guardian. Yeah, so obviously the Jurgen Klopp interview that Donald McRae has done. Klopp, let's rip Roma, Salah, Merkel, Man City and Brexit. Um, the Brexit stuff is among the most interesting. But we were just saying here, it's obviously a great photograph, that uh, you read this online last night. I read this online yesterday. Yeah, I read this online. Yeah, which uh, really is amazing how much brilliant stuff uh, newspapers are giving away. Now, The Guardian always has that message that comes up and says, you know, uh, if you please, like our if stuff, you like our stuff, money. pay for it. Um, but I was really surprised, particularly because of the, of the quality of the, of the interview with McRae. It's so good. Like, he goes, he crosses everything from, you know, asking him, would he run for uh, office in, in Germany? Um, you know, there's so much stuff in it. Um, and I just am, so was really surprised to read it and then see uh, that it was in today's papers. Yeah. yeah that it's, it's, it's in the print a day later. But it is, you know, it's a state of the nation from Klopp. Um, interestingly, you know, it was been used to deflect a lot of stuff away from, um, but he obviously got this over the weekend with him, I think, and, and put it out. Um, there's something about Klopp, like so just sometimes when you think, you know, he's so far up himself, then, you know, he surprises you with something and you think, no. And I saw a great interview with him recently on TV where, um, you know, he was talking about when he was a kid and getting um, shirts and boots and he, ne he would never take them off and he ran around the house all day long in his football boots and his shirt and he never took it off you know and there is that boyish you know charm about him just that you, it's an infectious enthusiasm yeah um definitely one of the most compelling figures in world football at the moment and it turns out really talented like not nothing nothing that he's achieved has been a fluke at any stage of the way because there was there was times where it was like oh he can't defend his team's not defending he knows nothing about football it was like yeah well hang on a second you know just give him and then he signs virgil van dyke and suddenly he's like ooh Actually, he knows a lot about football. Yeah, and he, and, he, and he is the only one in England who's figured out how to beat Man City this season as well. Do you know what I mean? Um, but this one I like, what I like about it as well is just just his worldview. You know what I mean? He, like, how does he end up talking about Brexit? And, you know, how does he end up talking about the European Union and Merkel and all that kind of stuff? Because he's interested. He's interested in politics, you know. And the one thing you could, you could always say about him, and there's a great line from McRae at the beginning of it about, you know, we just, he's more than this mad, gurning lunatic on the sideline, you know, is that world view you know and he talks about you know he's talking about the European Union and what it's done and yeah. uh, you know but but world world things a sense of context and history and yeah exactly yeah. so so many managers you think there's they have nothing outside of football yeah. he definitely has well Wenger for example the, one of the points that's been made this week is that like Wenger completely assessed by football bragging about working seven days a week and it's yeah. like yeah yeah well, you know, maybe you should be able to communicate with your players a bit better by having some life experience outside. I mean, look, Wenger's really rich and successful and he's going to die a happy man, I'm sure. Yeah, but, but I did think it was strange this week, the way he stressed that thing of, I've worked seven days a week. And you thought, you don't have to prove that anymore. Why would you be making such a big deal of that? Yeah. You know, and also, as, as people said, what, wh where will he go now? Like, in terms of what, what you must have a life outside football. Yeah. You know, even Fergie had a life outside football. We know, we know he liked his glass of wine. And we know racing. he liked his racing. Do you know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. Uh, did he like the racing just because, you know, I'm not sure. <laughs> let's, get, let's get back into the Rockets brought. It's been a while since we've talked about it. <laughs> Final story for now, um, for me, is the Irish News. And again, they also have Jurgen Klopp on the back. The only ones who don't have Mohamed Salah. Reds can't play on the pass, says Klopp. And then that's a story about Rafferty, a worry for Armagh. So we're going to start getting these injury worry stories ahead of 
the championship, which is actually like two and a half weeks away now. It's kind of yeah. breathing down our neck. And it's a, well, the surprising thing I think is that um, there's there isn't more GA in the in it. But I know it's meant to be closed season and everything, and that's why I think that Brendan Murphy story is a great story to break this morning because and that BBC story because people are just crying out for inter county news at this stage. You the know? official it's launches are all happening this week as well. We're we're just staffing up, deciding who's going to go to yeah. which of the provinces and. Um, so I think that's the bit where the GAA riders start clicking back into gear. You see the match previews, you start seeing the yeah. championship pullouts, all that kind of stuff. I assume. Yeah, yeah. And there was actually one of the interesting things in the papers today, and it's in a few of them, is the CPA, um, you know, the players, the Club Players Association, um, because, you know, they have obviously been monitoring the amount of club action that's been taking place in this so-called, you know, club, club month of April. Um, and I think was it 50, just f between 50 and 60 uh, said they were happy with uh, the amount of club action that happened. A similar amount said they hadn't had a master fixture list that's, for the but year. But that's what they were given out, but more primarily is why don't they have a master fixture for the beginning of the year exactly, yeah. Um, yeah, a couple of really good pieces um, in the Examiner in particular is uh, Mike Quirk piece where he's talking about how the county players didn't play league matches at the weekend, even though they're supposed to be available for their clubs. The players were available, apparently, according to the county board. That's like a very swiftly, let's in, answer. In, oh, Jesus, in he's, got a, he's got a column in the examiner about it. We better issue a in statement. No, no, they were all grand. They were all totally available. They just couldn't, for whatever collective reason, at the same time, play for their clubs. Mike Quirk's, Mike Quirk's column is always worth reading. Yeah. It's a really good column. A really always. clever guy. Yeah, he's a good, good writer. So where are we going next, Lena? Um, well, again, uh, the Times Ireland, uh, again, it's the same thing. Mo Salah, um, Jason Ford, Earls as well. Um, the one that interested me in the Times Ireland was um, the Dylan Hartley story. Just, oh, yeah. Um, because he's not going to go on tour with England this summer because he's had three concussions in three seasons. And he talked about it, I think, earlier this year. Um, and it's just like... You know, if if you if he's had that series of concussions, and his club said he's ha he has to take the summer off, that's a worrying thing. And he's already talked about it this some this year. He said, you know, when you have kids, you you start to think about these things. Yeah. Um. So that's the question: is you know, and will he, if he if he comes back, you know, will he captain England? I mean, Farrell is there, and he's obviously the the obvious one that yeah. will take over there as well. So I think that one was interesting. He got um, that concussion against Ireland. So that's the one out, he got exactly. He's been out since that game. Since then, yeah. He's going to play now until next August or September. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, the Mirror, um, again, uh, I suppose a, c a lot of them have, have stories about uh, Ulster and uh, uh, Leinster and the players and where they're going to go. Um, I thought it was best covered probably by uh, Jerry Thornley in the Irish Times and a couple of people who make the same point, which is that um, this talk of Ross Byrne, uh, pressure being put on Leinster to let Ross Byrne or Joey Carberry go to Ulster. Unlike somebody like Jordy Murphy, whose contract is up, they're still in the middle of their contract. Yeah. And John Fogarty was wheeled out by Leinster yesterday to say they won't be going unless, you know, it was something they, they wanted want to. to do. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, and and it, was well, it was well covered here yesterday by Brian O'Driscoll. I think the really interesting thing is that, they're for, that, that if, if IRFU are pushing them, that they're pushing them to Ulster. Because if you look at Munster, mm. wouldn't Munster be a great fit for Carberry? Who would who you need, rather go to? Who needs somebody at 10 and 15, right? And if you're worried about a club that, you know, the coaching, the coaching or the competition quality might be great, Munster would be a good fit as yeah. well. I noticed he, he said last weekend, that was a really interesting quote from him in, in a good interview with Kieran Shannon, he said, I mean, Carberry said, I'm impatient about a lot of things in life, but I'm not impatient about this. Yeah. Literally at the moment, it seems like Leinster is one of the best organised, most well-run clubs in world rugby. Yeah. And in Stuart Lancaster, you have a coach who is reaching the peak of his powers, who has like... 25 years of experience, particularly of bringing young players through. So if you're looking at that as him, as Carberry, it's like, okay, well, Johnny Sexton is the best out half in the world or the second best out half. Week by week, it changes between whether or not Barrett <laughs> or him or everybody thinks is the best. So if I can get ahead of him, then I'm actually going to be one of the best players in the world. So how do I get ahead of him? Or alternatively, and I got one go at it last year. Alternatively, I go up to season. Ulster and play behind a pack that's not great with a coach that I don't know who might not actually like me or want me. What are you going to do? Yeah, or what if it was Munster? What if the suggestion would be to Munster? <laughs> I think that would be, nobody has even, now obviously that's not the I refuse suggestion, but it is an interesting one. And the thing about Carberry is, he has lived a very peripatetic life. He came from New Zealand, 
11 to Ireland, he, fit, he had to fit in the Thai, learn a new way of life. He went to Black Rock for his leaving search, particularly for rugby. He went from UCD to Clontarf, particularly for rugby. So he's a guy who's not afraid to make decisions for rugby. Yeah. And I just think it's an interesting one. Uh, would, you want to, would anybody want to leave Leinster at the moment? No, of course not, you know. But if I'm you're sure. pragmatic, how patient are you going to be? It's interesting to see what it was. But the, I mean, the, the tenor of all the pieces today is Leinster saying these guys will be going nowhere unless they want to go somewhere. Yeah, and that puts pressure on them because obviously they'll feel like, you know, off the record stuff can be said to them yeah. about their <laughs> about their international futures. Like, yeah. you know, a quiet warning or a, well, it would be better for you if you did this. And yeah. like, Very interesting, Fogarty, Fogarty says in that piece in the Irish Times about um, how, how did the Geordie Murphy thing happen? Yeah. And he says, I don't know. I was, I was told about that. I was told about yeah. that. <laughs> I think it's interesting. And the in, uh, actually on a need-to-know basis. Yeah, actually, and in the Herald today, um, Des Berry has a, has a list of the amount of Ulster players that are already in, or uh, Leicester players that are already yeah. in Ulster, yeah. And like they have three academy players. Then they have Alan, Alan O'Connor, John John. Cooney, Nick Timoney and Dave Shandon. We know Jordy Murphy and Marty Moore are going up to M1 as well this this uh, this summer or whatever. So um, the, the big question you have to I ask is, Ulster have so apparently have a lot of money. They don't seem to be short of money. Why are they not developing this depth themselves? Yeah. That is a question worth asking. Well, they, they did let Chris Farrell go and they did let um, Sam Arnold yeah, go. So yeah. it's not like they've also been brilliant at mind, minding their own talent coming through the ranks. Yeah, you know, like, yeah, yeah. Um, Brian O'Driscoll used the word basket case in connection with it yesterday and he was picked up about it on Twitter and shot back immediately with the list of things that aren't going well for them at the moment. And you're yeah. like, well, it's hard to... It's hard to say that it's a well-run club. And this is the CEO of Ulster Rugby <coughs> who stood up seven years ago and said, oh, we're going to be world-class, we're going to be world leaders. And it's like, it's been pretty much downhill ever since. Like, at some point, somebody well, in that hierarchy has well, they, to be well, and, 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 Well, yeah, and let's just say there's a whole load of stuff that's happened this year, clearly, that has caused havoc for them. Do you know what I mean? That you could never have, as a CEO, envisioned any of that happening, to be fair. No, yeah. no, but you, you could have been better with your academy system, you could well, have had a better a, recruitment system. Well, that's the question I'd ask. Where is the depth in their academy exactly? Why why, why is it that Leinster's academy seems to be have such, like, it seems to have a treble depth from everybody else's academy. They're just yeah. churning them out. I mean, mostly I think it's to do with the amount of money that's spent on the schools teams in the private schools and the facilities yeah, and coaches that yeah, they have. Yeah, possibly, that's exactly. The, that's exactly that's it, yeah. Advantage. A couple of quick texts for you. Darren Sherlock says, FFS. Uh, we have the afters of a family wedding on the day of Monaghan and Tyrone. We were hoping to watch in the pub. Now, that's not to say that Sky won't step in and uh, you will be able to watch it in the pub. Um, Sky to the rescue in that circumstance. <laughs> uh, Noel Cal says that it shows that players in weaker counties do not believe in the structures. This is the news that Brendan Murphy is heading to the States for the summer. I mean, it's true. And also the five... Me players like who actually really have nothing to play for when you think about it. Yeah, and like I see this in women's Gaelic all the time, where a lot of players, women's Gaelic really suffers from a lot of players going to America in the summer or going travelling in the summer, and the reason for it is that there's there is no prestige to staying to play for their counties. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? There's no, there's just not that you know bonus that there is for men to play for their inter-county games. You know where you know it's a big deal, and I just think that prestige thing is lacking in a lot of women's counties, um, and so. It happens in the weaker men's counties as well, but yeah. it is it is a bad indictment that that prestige is not there for Meath now, you know. And as I said, after winning something, it's a big it's a big hit for Carlo. Yeah. You know, when they when they seem to be building such momentum. Kevin McCallion, uh, I think the most uh, stereotypical GA response ever to Damien Comer's uh, mild bit of confidence. It's okay saying the dubs are beatable, but doing it is totally different. Comer should be more worried about baiting Mayo in a few weeks. <laughs> I've no doubt he's absolutely 100% But focused. maybe that's why he was talking about Dublin so exactly, much. Exactly, yeah. It's a, it's a good <laughs> Anything kind of but Mayo to be asked about. Diversionary tactic, but yeah. yeah. Thanks for that, Kevin. Bang on cue. Where next? Um, the star, obviously, uh, and the, a lot of them are talking about that. You know, kick Mo and you'll cop it, and it's just the whole thing of will they, t will will Farah be targeted by Roma? You know, and how, who's going to take him on if you like? So that's across a lot of them. But the one that interested me was. Um, uh, there was a piece saying, uh, Kolarov says, there's no plan in place for Salah, which seems bizarre because surely you have a, a complete lie. Yeah. Um, the one, another one, uh, Eamon Dunphy's column obviously is always interesting for people and he's, he, the headline on it is the first cut is the deepest. Um, and in, in terms of, you know, 
at Anfield, home advantage and everything. But there's a piece in the London Times, which is really interesting, times.ie, and they're saying that actually if you look at the statistics of all the top English clubs in, uh, in Europe in the last few years, uh, Liverpool are the ones with the worst uh, home advantage statistics. Right. If you if you break okay. it down, actually, it's less of advantage for them than it was for people like Chelsea and Man United or whatever. Right. That's home interesting. In the Champions League, yeah. So, um, statistics damned, damned lies and statistics. You never know. Um, the Sun again. Uh, the headline is you know Klopp Mo's gonna Mo gonna get a kick in. They're all everybody's worried about this. Ian Wright has a good piece and probably captures that thing that Roma sold a thirty million player. And now they're facing a hundred million superstar. Yeah, and you know it is an six months later. It's incredible, you know, his rise in such a short time is the incredible thing, I suppose, as well. And in the same week that he's just got player of the player of the year in England as well. Um, and uh, Neil Reardon has good piece as well in the Sun, and that's on Wes Hulhan. He won't return to the League of Ireland, and of course, um, uh, he, the argument is, or they were, the, the thinking was, I suppose, was, could he come back? He's ex Shelburne, own here, he's in charge, and yeah. would he come back to Shelburne? It'll be but an amazing he seems, end. He seems to, he has ruled it out in this piece anyway, so yeah. But you never know, Damien Duff came back, didn't he? Yeah, it, I mean, like Wes definitely has a, a life in, um, in Norwich, I think, so kind of very embedded in the community as well, so it'll be interesting to see where he does fetch up. But imagine season. if he ever did come back. You know, because there's such a love for him in this country. Yeah, you know. it would put a lot of numbers on. It surely would. <laughs> and presumably it would have to be somewhere like, you know, Shelburne, where he played before and he has that, that connection. Um, and uh, the, the, actually the other one in the, I think Gordon Manning has it in the sun as well is, and here's another one, the GA story is starting to break. Jack Guiney is gone off the Wexford hurling panel. All right. Yeah, again is the phrase again because he went off it before yeah. and allegedly for disciplinary reasons. Right, that's a pity because it looked like it looked like him and Davy had some kind of coming yeah, together well, yeah, and they'd got understood back, each other. Yeah, and, and then he got injured and he was out for a long time with injuries as well. But he is one of those players who ha undoubtedly has talent. Yeah. But uh, for some reason doesn't seem to stay or he has problems staying on county panels. And like... A senior county panel anyway. The commitment that Davy requires from... You know, the yeah. last year, whenever they trained that 6,000 days in a row, whatever it was, <laughs> um, yeah, it, it, it's pretty severe and very intense. So um, hopefully at yeah. some point... Jack it, oh, sorry, so it. Jason Byrne has the story, actually, and it's um, he's been asked, quote for quote, for disciplinary reasons. So it apparently happened last week. Okay. And there's, you know, um, a lot of time between now and Championship and, you know, things can back. change. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, yeah. There's always that can happen. Have we one last paper to go through? Um, I think that's the last, yeah. Um, uh, yeah, I think so. All right, well, let's move on. Uh, rugby Players Ireland and Zurich have teamed up with Irish international rugby player Keith Earls to announce the nominees for the 2018 Zurich Players Player of the Year Award. Keith popped into studio yesterday straight off the flight home from Munster's defeat to Racing. He has been nominated for the 2018 Zurich Players Player of the Year along with fellow Grand Slam winners Tyke Furlong, Connor Murray and Johnny Sexton. It's a tough enough competition, isn't it? This would have been a much better competition for the uh, player of the tournament. Jacob Stockdale <laughs> doesn't make the Players Player shortlist. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah, exactly. They know what they're talking about. Murray and Sexton ahead of them, Tyke Furlong ahead of them. Anyway, Katie Fitzhenry, Kira Griffin and Claire Malloy were all nominated for the BNY Mellon Women's 15 Player of the Year 2018. Jordan Larmer, James Ryan and Jacob Stockdale are nominated for the Nevin Spence Young Player of the Year Award. The Zurich Irish Rugby Players Awards will take place on Wednesday the 16th of May at the Clayton Hotel in Ballsbridge. Here's how we get on with Keith. All right, I'd like to say uh, thanks very much to Keith Earls for coming in. Keith, in the aftermath of defeat, it's very hard to face the media, particularly when, you know, uh, it hasn't gone as well as you might have done. So um, thanks for coming in and <laughs> not no phoning problem. in sick today. I'm sure the temptation was pretty high. Yeah, yeah, it was. Um, could have stayed in bed all day or could have hung around with my kids for the day, you know, but look, this, it's all part of it. Uh, it was interesting. As soon as um, we heard that you were coming in, the thing that struck me the most was um, not the brilliant form that you're in or the amazing recovery from injury or the season that you're having on a personal level, but just that one comment in the middle of the Six Nations where you talked about having perspective and how when you have kids, you watch what's going on in Syria and all of a sudden, this is a match, I can relax, I'm going to be fine, it's just a game. When did that happen for you? When did you begin to be able to access that type of as you say, perspective, and, and use it as something that's beneficial for all of us in the real world. Yeah, I suppose it was, um, you know, I've said it before, it was probably Axel's passing, 
you know, and I suppose seeing seeing what he went through that with that season was it 2016 with a with a very bad season and we were underperforming and you know he would he would have got a brunt of it and I suppose leading up to you know his passing it probably wasn't a nice year for him and his family and you know when you see what people were saying about him and what they were saying about us as a team and then when when he passed rugby became irrelevant like you know it it didn't really matter and you know suddenly people were you know they were probably guilty about some of the things they said but look I thought that man was invincible you know everything worked out for him like you know he'd he'd a great rugby career he'd beautiful wife and kids and all of a sudden he's not there and you know for me at home I probably would have been a bit too obsessed with rugby and and not enjoying my kids or my wife and I suppose that's what I'm leaning towards now is enjoying them rather than like and it obviously makes it a bit easier with, with rugby you know and obviously yesterday's defeat you know it, it hurts and it, it it's frustrating and we'll have a look at it and you know we're we're, we're sick of losing but I suppose now I've learnt that look I'm I'm waking up next to my wife and, and my kids and so that helps a small bit. Yeah, it's funny how um, so many people talk about going through these life experiences to actually be able to bring it into your day to day and, and it not to be overbearing, you know, to live with it in a way that's normal or to kind of um, to be able to access it when you need to. Is that something that required work or is it just immediately from that? Was it just a, a, a switch gets flicked and you're like, okay, I'm never going back to that because there's no point? Yeah, no, it was. It's immediately, you know, and it's 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 something that you have to work on mm. then as well, like working on, I suppose, your pattern, your thought and negativity and some of the things that annoy you and get you down, you know, and they're, they're only small things and, you know, if, if something doesn't work at home and you freak out or if something's cancelled and you freak out, it's, 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 it's not the worst thing that's going on in the world really, you know, and... Um, you know, I'm 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 living a a great life, and all my teammates are living a great life, and we and we get to do what we what we love. You know, there's there's loads of ups and downs, but you know, when you put so much into to rugby, and you know, and you keep coming up short, it can be frustrating. And you know, we something we're going to have to have a look, have a look at. You know, as a team. Yeah, and I'm not that you will. Like, uh, it's clear that there's the brain power and the in- intention to do it. Just to go back to the Syria comment, it was really, it's funny how um, the, the bubble is the thing that gets referred to in a lot of instances in, in those press conferences, you know, we're just in the bubble, we're in the environment, or whatever, but like clearly you, you aren't always in the bubble in the environment, you are watching the news and you are being affected by what's going on. Was that just, is that just who you are anyway? Is that like what you've always been like? Were you always into that, watching the news and keeping abreast of stuff? Or again, is this kind of, as a parent, there are certain images that you can't unsee? Yeah, I suppose when, when I became a a parent first, you know, when when my daughter was born and she she was she had a respiratory condition and you know it's that's that's another thing that put things in perspective, you know, that you know, that everyone was gearing up for the Six Nations and it was the most important thing ever and I was sitting in a hospital in, in Limerick and then in Dublin with my little baby girl, you know, and I then you know, when you see some of the kids in Syria full of dust after being bombed and stuff and then you think about your own kids and you think about the life they're having and you know I think a lot of us can do with with having a look at that and and learning from that you know I think we're quite lucky you know we, we live in a beautiful country it's you know we give out about the weather but when you look at things you know I know there's a lot of homeless people but when you look at the safety between terrorist attacks and everything that's going on you know I think I think we're, we're quite blessed yeah so it's important not to just be in the bubble the whole time and actually get that sense of perspective yeah and that and that's something I'm trying to do and obviously I'm, I'm 30 now and hopefully there's another couple of years in me like I try and connect with the real world a small bit now as well yeah um, like you're playing the best rugby of your life though is that fair to say do you feel that way I'm enjoying it I'm enjoying it, that's, you know, and, um, that's the main thing. You know, it probably is a season that has been 
riddled with one or two injuries. I had my groin injury in the summer, hamstring in November, and my knee in the last couple of weeks. A couple of years ago would have been a disaster of a season, but I suppose I'm looking after myself and I'm not losing too much fitness when I get injured. And, you know, I don't, I'm, I suppose I don't have a lot of a ring rust when I, when I get back. Why is that? Why are you better doing that now than you would have been, say, when you were 20 or 21? Cause I think I'm more professional now. I'm looking after myself more. Um, a couple of years ago when I got injured, I probably would have took the foot off the pedal, whereas now it, I ramp it up. You know, I I try and find whatever it takes to, to get back that week early, which which I did yesterday, like, you know. Why did the penny drop on that? When did you decide, actually, I need to be more professional? I suppose when things weren't, weren't working out for me, you know, as I said in interviews during Six Nations, I just thought my talent alone would get me there, but, you know, I probably didn't have the, the top two inches right, and, you know, thankfully I've, I've, I've trained that now, and I'm looking after myself a bit more, and... There was one other really interesting thing from the Six Nations that you were talking about, it was, um, you mentioned Keith Barry, here's a clip, let's just want to play you this, you can stick your earphones in for this one. Well, I've, I've, I've obviously been relaxing a bit as well and as I'm getting older now, I'm trying to find out the 1% between, between diet and stuff and I suppose the psychology side of things as well and the visualisation, I've, I've been working a, a, a bit with, with Keith Barry as well. So, um, you know, just try, trying to get them, them 1% which, is, which, which, which seems to be working. And what's Keith been able to do Look, we just, I don't want to get into detail, we just, you know, he's... He, he knows the brain better than anyone and uh, just in terms of visualisation and stuff like that. But as I said, it's, it's, it's down to, to everything between diet, looking after myself, having the balance of family life and, and work and, and obviously the, the working on the mental side with him and obviously uh, Inda's here as well, you know, working with him, you know, and combining it all together. Does keep our work with Um... <laughs> I think it's bits and pieces. Um, look, I, I don't want to. I don't know if he's comfortable with me me saying that, so I don't want to get into to detail about it. But it, it's something I I I really enjoy working with him. Again, a kind of sign of the maturity that you're at at this stage of your career, where you're happy to go and seek help from a, an outside agency and not just rely on yourself. Yeah, and I suppose I would have learned that from from Paul O'Connor as well. You know, he was always obsessed about getting the one percent as well, you know, and you know, seeing how hard he worked and and what he's achieved and some of the things he's I see him work on and it happening for him on the field and you know, the mental side of things in sports is is huge, you know, and as I said I probably lacked that a small bit when I was younger. And can you did you check with Keith? Are you happy to talk about it now or is that still something that you gonna wanna keep? Yeah, like like I've met Keith a few times, he, he doesn't hypnotise me or anything like that, you know, it's just, it's just, I, I suppose, working with Linda McNulty as well, I didn't, you know, we sp spoke about visualisation, but I didn't actually know how how to do it, and I met Keith in camp one day, and... Did he, was he just there, kind of, as, you guys get guests in all yeah, the time, yeah. and so you just had a chat with him afterwards, it wasn't, you didn't seek him out? Yeah, no, he, he obviously, he was in, he was in during the World Cup as well, and he was in maybe in November or something like that and you know some comment he made and I picked up on it and you know I, I went to our manager and asked could I get his number and have a chat with him and, and what he thinks and he he made visualising a lot easier for, right. for me you know we go through scenarios about the game the weekend he kind of first is about relaxing and then Do you ever think um how different life would be if your 30 year old self could tap your 21 year old self on the shoulder and go here listen there's a few things I just, want, I just want to sit you down for five minutes here and go through a few bits and pieces or did you have to discover them yourself anyway yeah no it's like obviously I had to discover but I, I, I wish you wouldn't mind having that chat yeah I wouldn't mind having that chat with myself now when I was I was 21 you know and Look, for any young lad there, you know, you think, oh, there's always going to be next year, or maybe next year I'll try it, but look, it has taken me 10 years to 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 win something that, I, that I'm very proud of. Obviously, I've won the, the Magners and, and that with, with Munster, like, but, you know, to achieve something that 
isn't done so often. Yeah. You know, that was um, that, that was massive and I suppose I regret um, taking other stuff for granted. This is the cutest route to get there, but it's like, it is a, it's a Grand Slam that you're a key part of as well. Like, there's no, you know, you're not a bit part player, you're definitely one of the first names on the team sheet and you're having an impact in every game. Like, uh, I think one of the memories that sticks out for everybody is the Italy game where a lost cause gets chased down and, and from a defensive perspective. Do you remember that? Do you remember what's going through your head when you're chasing down the Italian who's streaking away to score at the end of a game where it doesn't look like it's, it's going to matter but the whole crowd still is like, ah. Yeah, I suppose it's, you know, not wanting to give up and um, you just don't know, you know, you, you see Jamie Heaslip's tackle and Stuart Hogg um, two years before that, I think, and that wins the championship for for Ireland and you know if, if, if it had gone down you know that's what I was thinking if could easily left him going in the corner I was going to chase him whether I caught him or not you know to get him to score in the corner you know I think Karen Reid done it Ireland in 2013 he it was a Cairns he chased down and mm. and that was the difference of winning but I think it's just about habits we try and teach ourselves good habits and, and to never give up and I think that's all Irish people care about is, is you know, giving, giving it your all. And if you can give it your all, you can look yourself in the mirror as well after a game. One last thing. The, the role of the winger in Irish rugby seems to have changed a, a little bit even over the last couple of years. There was a period there where we were largely kicking the ball and using the skill set that we had, which, you know, if you've got Tommy Bow at 6'4 and a brilliant fielder, you might kick the ball to Tommy Bow at 6'4 yeah. and a brilliant fielder. But um, it seems that the evolution in the style of play has certainly helped players like you and even Andrew Conway, and we see now with somebody like Jordan Larmer who aren't 6'4, um, that we're not just going to be a kicking team. We're going to, and if we are a kicking team, you guys are obviously all brilliant in the air, but that uh, fundamentally we're going to mix it up and keep the opposition guessing. Yeah, and and that's the thing. Like you, it's trying to become the all rounder player and not be good at just one thing. You know, I, I think teams. You know, it's getting better and better. Our defenses are getting better. Our attacks are getting better, and you just need to keep teams guessing. You know, and as you said, there was the point in kicking the ball to someone who who can't catch it or who isn't used to going up in the air. Or, you know, if if a winger needs to hit a rock to keep someone else free, you know, and I suppose that that's what it's about, and it's actually a, a great feeling as well if you if you can be good at all all different aspects of the game. Yeah, enjoyable to play in in the team at the moment in the Ireland team. Yeah, it's great and enjoyable playing Munster and Ireland at the moment. Obviously, yes, there was what's extremely disappointing, but um, yeah, Ireland were. We're on a high, um, I'm, I'm loving rugby, you know, and um, I suppose it's something I didn't do years ago either, was um, was enjoy it, and uh, I'm relishing the, the big games, and I just want to be in more and more big games and test myself and put myself under pressure, you know. Well, there's plenty more to come, Keith. Great stuff, thanks very much. Cheers, thank you. Yeah, great stuff from Keith Earls there, and thanks to Rugby Players Ireland and to Zurich for uh, sorting that out. And of course, as I said, those Zurich Irish Rugby Player Awards will take place on Wednesday, the 16th of May, at the Clayton Hotel in Ballsbridge. Um, now, if, if you want to leave any comments for us, you can leave them under whatever stream you happen to be watching this on. We're live on Periscope, at Off The Ball. Uh, that's so Twitter, for those of you who are unfamiliar with the Periscope. Uh, YouTube.com forward slash Off The Ball, and of course, Facebook.com forward slash Off The Ball. And remember to turn on your notifications or subscribe, depending on where you're watching it. And if you just want to listen to this, we have an audio-only stream. You just have to click the play button at offtheball.com on the website and uh, you won't be distracted by us uh, visually in the morning. Let's move on to our uh, breakfast menu this morning. So here are five talking points that we're going to go through with Kleena. Mickey Hart's use of the GAA. Kleena, this has um, proved to be a bit of a hot topic. Um, a lot of people are pretty disgusted by the fact that there was a suggestion that this was actually Gaelic voices for... A certain thing. Yeah, that, the it was G, under that the, the GA was under the GA banner. But, but I, people got, uh, typically people got a bit hysterical very quickly for no reason in my opinion. Um, I think the phrase or the, the, the term they used about themselves was GA athletes for whatever it was. Okay, so uh, 
I don't have a problem with people, um, you know, using that banner because I think it's used all the people, sports people use their their profile all the time for, you know, to espouse causes. I don't think that's a problem. Trevor Hogan's, you know, pro-Palestinian, uh, David Hickey, pro-Cuba, you know what I mean? We've seen it in GA before. They're not allowed, obviously, um, uh, affiliate with a political party. But what I didn't particularly like about this was that of this group, I think three of them were from Ulster, Right, and this is a, a law to be enacted and won't affect them personally. But secondly, I thought it was very strange that they came down to Ballyfermot in Dublin to do, uh, to do something and to work with kids and to use their platform there. And I just thought that looked a little bit strange. Why didn't they do it even, you know, across the border in Donegal or wherever, you know, from Tyrone or wherever they were from? There? Like, just it seemed, it seemed an odd fit. Yeah, um, the press release did talk about we and us as the GA and the GA's core values having these things, which was that kind of sense of like, oh, okay, you've, you've got some kind of centralised endorsement, as opposed to when Trevor went as a rugby player, yeah. he went as an individual. When David Hickey did that, it was clear yeah, that he was so doing it as an individual. Yeah, as from an individual. Else. yeah, I loved it. Actually. You know, it was brilliant that day. Not everybody else was kind of holding hands. On the back of his shirt, yeah. yeah. No, no absolutely. But, um, but, I, but I think it does actually speak a lot about the GA's place in the community. You know, I know somebody who had no interest in sport, Dub, who ended up going down the country because, moved down the country, had kids, got involved in GA and, you know, with great shock, he said to me once, oh my God, the GA is like a socialist, it's like a socialist organisation, you know, and it is, that's the, you know, it is a community-based uh, organisation. So people who have strong feelings about something that they think is going to affect their community, you know, We'll, we'll use the GA tag. GA were smart, came in quickly and said, they don't speak for us. Uh, and also remind all the county boards, you're not allowed to get involved in any of these things. But as an individual, we are. And also we've seen Amy McGee and people in Donegal have, you know, gone out as well. And so I don't have a problem. It's a democracy. People can, you know, I, I, I don't think why people, you know. I would definitely agree with that. The polarisation of people even on this whole issue is, is what is unsatisfactory. It's people are entitled to say what they want to say. Absolutely. I, again, I, I would say Amy McGee never kind of said, I'm, I'm speaking on behalf of the whole Donegal GAA setup. Because obviously he wasn't. I mean, yeah, yeah. Karen Cassidy had, would have had um, debates on Twitter down through the years as well. So, yeah, uh, yeah I, I think it's going to be interesting to see if there's any response from the GA community to the fact that it did seem like they were trying to... Oh, there's, but there's no argument. They were trying to use their GA clout, if you like, you know what I mean? But as some kind but of collective... that's not illegally. Some that's kind of collective megaphone. As uh, opposed to actually, here I am as an individual. You know, like afterwards they're like, oh yeah, no, we're, we're only speaking as individuals. But, but actually, but, but, but that also, wasn't the banner. They're yeah, but the GA rules don't stop them doing that. They stop them from representing or uh, affiliating themselves with a political party, and that's not what this is doing. So I don't have a problem with that. But I do have a problem with where it was done. And it seems to have been done in a very strange way because the local GA club quickly distanced themselves because there was an inference that it ha was held on their grounds and yeah. it wasn't. So when you see people having when to I say, hold on, this has nothing yeah. to do with us. What? But why pick Ballyfermot, you know, uh, an area, you know, uh, an urban area, um, you know, an area that, you know, has, a tra has traditionally, you know, had has poverty in it. Why pick an area like that? I just thought that was a very, very strange thing to do. And that's what I wouldn't like about it. I thought that was just a bit... Very odd. Okay, our second point here is uh, Dublin Mayo rivalry renewed. This is about the uh, little. Yeah, the women. Yeah, the yeah. little. The, the national league, the women's football, because there two. They, well, there was a series of brilliant women's semi-finals actually in the little national league, in a couple of divisions at the weekend. But the really interesting one is that the the division one final now is going to be Dublin Mayo. It's going to be a replay of last year's All Ireland final. And the interesting thing was that. Um, Dublin and a brilliant Nicole Owen goal got Dublin through. They just snuck it from Galway. There was so a tweet, I think, from the official, um, from one of the accounts anyway, saying, oh, it's going to be a Galway Mayo yeah, final. Yeah, it was that Dublin close. Some, yeah, some and her, the goal was fantastic. Go, on, go online and find the goal. The goal was a cracker. Um, and I think it's interesting as well to see Mayo back in here because they haven't had Cora all winter. Um, and it looks to me as if, like, t uh, they were in the league final two years ago, Division One league final. and. You know, they shot wide after wide after wide against Cork, but now they've really stepped it up. They've got a really good full forward line, um, Sarah Rowe and the two Kelly sisters. So they're, they're now starting to score and they're clocking up big scores. And Sinead Kafke, who was the star, and she has really been a quiet star over the winter. Um, she scored a great goal and then she saved one off the line and the other one. So it's going to be, and it's great to see that kind of rivalry, to teams coming up in rivalries. That's you need important. It. Yeah, you absolutely need it. You absolutely need, it. Yeah. absolutely need that narrative. There was a concern maybe that once Dublin had 
got over the line and found how to win an All-Ireland final, yeah. that they were going to be as dominant as the men's team. Yeah, yeah. And you would kind of hope that maybe um, a few setbacks along no. the way might actually and, be and good that's for the sport. And that's what's really healthy. Division 1 and Division 2 as well in women's football at the moment is there's lots of teams able to, you know, just on the verge. Goey got strong again last year and came back into it. And <coughs> um, div the Division 2 final is going to be a cracker as well. Tipperary, who have, you know, uh, won an All-Ireland Intermediate final and just have some great players. Uh, they're back into a final. They're into the final against Cavan, who were in the final again last year. So there are there are teams coming through, and I think that's what's really healthy. Is it's not just Cork, Cork, Cork anymore. There's yeah. loads of teams coming. Yeah, for sure. Okay, so club calls for uh, Brexit revote. This is um, Jurgen Klopp in part of his Donald McRae. Donald, I always mistake Donald and Duncan. <laughs> It is Donald, isn't it? Yeah. It is Donald. Yeah. Yeah, well, the one line, it's funny, the line that was picked out and used, um, you know, as the strap on this in, in uh, online yesterday, and I think in some of the papers today was that one of his quotes, and if you hear this quote, which is, I have this helping syndrome, I really care about people, I, I feel pretty much responsibility for everything. You think, what an idiot, you know, for goodness sake, you know, you don't have to go on about that. But then when you read the rest of it in context, it is really interesting. And I wanted to be a doctor when he was a teenager. Yeah. Yeah, 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 and and also what, get the points. what's interesting is is and even this, you know, I think I mean I just think as well even on the um, on the abortion referendum, you know, athletes are and managers they're multifaceted people, they're multidimensional people, and I think that's what we you know we want to know their dimensions. You know, we mightn't agree with them always, you know, but it's good to see it. So that's why I thought that interview was very interesting and. Um, he, as I said, he, he poo poos the notion that he would run for politics, and in the end, he says he's what is it, he's way better paid, and he gets a lot longer holidays. Basically, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's even, a great read. Even as a football manager, who works seven days a week. But his point about Brexit is really simple: it's that like people didn't fully understand exactly what they were voting for, yeah. that they had an uncertainty, that they weren't sure about Europe, and that ultimately, together, we have made better decisions than any time there's been divisions in history. That leads to war. To war, and also, like, he, he, and he does point out what everybody still says, which is. Why did it just take a simple majority? You know, 51.9% against 48.1% or whatever it was. Why wasn't it a two-thirds? Something so serious was decided by that tiny, Even tiny, Even GAA tiny Congress part. doesn't do that. Congre <laughs> exactly. <laughs> don't, don't start us in Congress. Uh, so, sharing the rugby talents. This is the other story that is obviously doing the rounds at the moment. Uh, what should happen? What will happen? There's an interesting headline in the Irish Times at the moment about how uh, Leinster can't force Carberry not to go. It's like as if they kind of have some sense that he wants double, to go. There's a double negative there as well. Even yeah. though last week he was doing interviews going, I don't want to go, yeah. I don't want to go. I mean, he's been injured for most of the year. That's one of the reasons well, why he's, he's played... Well, he's broken arm, and he? Yeah, yeah and like, yeah. so there was, two, there was two significant injuries, really. Um, every bit from November to the Six Nations was pretty much gone. So, like, what would it be like in a full season? He would play a lot more. That's the thing. Yeah, and also... Also, the, well, I suppose one of the interesting things for me is the Ross Bourne thing as well. So Ross Bourne is, is second, the number two for the number ten. And Ross Bourne had a brilliant season. Um, he's a really, he's kicking his metronomic. He's a big physical guy. His game, I think, has come on a lot in the last year. But he's not in line for Ireland, yeah. which is really interesting as well. And I think he could be at some point. That's the, that's the other side. That's of the maybe, question. Maybe is, he'll benefit he? from a move. Or maybe, yeah. like, maybe, I don't know. You yeah. have to wait and see exactly how far his career is going to go because he's funny, still very young. Last Christmas, I remember talking about, about the strength of of Leinster's um, underage system and wh what it was producing it. And I remember saying to, uh, it was on a panel and Jerry Thornley was on it, and I was saying, ideally there would be a loan system like there is in England, where you just literally loan somebody off there if you need them to get experience. And he turned to me and looked at me and he said, there already is. Leinster basically are feeding all the other provinces. So that does exist. That's there, as we've shown from those statistics. It's just, who, wants, who, you, who, you, who do you not want to go? Yeah. And why do you not want to, why do, and when do they want to go? That's yeah. the big question. Yeah, no, for sure. We can actually have a look. This is John Fogarty yesterday speaking to the Assembly Media at the Leinster Press Conference. We're not in the business of keeping or hoarding players here. We look at the overall group, see how we got game time for that, for that player, and see how we can help them develop. And, and that's kind of it. Um, if, he, if he can't, or if, if we see that we can't you know, f keep a player moving forward, and it happens, uh, we'll then have the discussion with the player or the RFU. Or th that's when that sort of stuff happens. Tyg Byrne is a really good example for us. So last year, you know, we would have sat down as a coaching group and sort of said, Jesus, this is a good player. He's, we, ha we haven't got game time for him. We haven't got enough game time for him. But he's a quality player. And that's when, that's when the decisions are kind of are made, certainly in here, where we'll where we look at that situation and say, right, well, 
it's time for, for Ty to go. And that's what he did, and he's done an amazing job, and he's, he's moved on and been, he's had a great time. But we, we don't want to be holding players for the sake of holding players. We, we're here to develop the players. That's fair enough. Mm. Mm, absolutely, yeah. And I think it's a really good point. And no, no, no club or, or province wants to keep players that aren't moving forward, that aren't developing. You don't want a player to be stagnating, which is a very good point. And know? also, they are trying to win the European Cup. It's not like they're trying to, you know, be competitive in these leagues. It's like their, their aim has to be to maximise the absolute number of big games that they can play to Absolutely. at some point become somehow but, self-sufficient. But the, but, the, but the key thing is that the RFU's aim is for Ireland to win the World Cup. Yeah, so and they're not the same aims, it turns no. out. Yeah. And uh, everybody, <laughs> oh, we're all we're all aligned, we're all singing from the same hymn sheet. They aren't. <laughs> Slightly different. So the last one that we want to talk about is brainwashing the kids. This is on the back of a load of interviews with Ian Rush in the newspapers today. You've got an interesting take on the fact that it's going to be a 45, 55, whatever the... Aviva Holes. Liverpool are coming into play. Is it? Is it? Is it? Liverpool, Liverpool Napoli. Napoli yeah. next. Next day, good Edwin. Yeah, I just. I'm always fascinated by why children follow a a Premiership football team, and what makes them follow a Premiership football team. And it seems it appears to me that nowadays a lot of it is because. Uh, their parents follow that football team and so from the age of four and five and six they're buying them shirts and they're they're just you know they're huge and I remember stopping in a in a petrol station last summer when um, there was one of these big pre-season friendlies on and there was also it was also a day with I think it was all Ireland semi-finals in Croker and the petrol station was chock-a-block at 11 o'clock in the morning you literally you queuing up there was buses the whole car park was full you know one of those big off the motorway ones yeah. and I was like oh my god they're all heading to, Do- to Dublin this is incredible and then I started looking at their jerseys and they were coming up to a pre-season friendly for a premiership team and they were little kiddies wearing these jerseys and I thought are they actually fans or is that just a little bit of brainwashing do you know what I mean like at what point do you let your child decide I'm going to I'm going to be a Luton fan you know or I'm going to be a Burnley fan it's how all religions work though right <laughs> it absolutely is it is it's indoctrination it's complete and utter brainwashing and I always you know I've always been grateful that my late dad in our house he let us all pick a team when we were little and in a house there was five of us and we all had a different we all, all had right. a different premiership team yeah 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 but it means you've got to go to five different... You can't, you can't make everybody happy by going we were, to one game. We were never going to matches. Sure, we were watching it on TV. That, that, this was back in the days before nobody could afford to go to England. Or uh, <laughs> all right. uh, who did you pick? I was a Man City fan. When I was all right. Kid. Yeah, and, and we had a... Dar- Dad was Arsenal, my brother was Derby, my other brother was Everton, and I was Man City. Okay, it's not a bad There you go, there you go, yeah. Not a single United Liverpool fan amongst no. you. <laughs> not that I have anything against them, but it is this notion of, you know, your children become obsessed with a football team because you're obsessed with a football team. Mm. And, um, and buying them the shirts from when they're tiny, and then... Yeah, a, a lot of times that happens, like it's, uh, what baby grow will we get for the baby? Oh, we get... Uh, football one because the da or the ma supports and it's That's like right. yeah okay <laughs> Uh, speaking of Liverpool slash Man United slash Real Madrid, Michael Owen was in Dublin on Sunday. He um, spoke with Joe on last night's football show. It's a podcast worth seeking out. It's really interesting stuff. It's one of the most interesting things you're ever going to see Michael Owen do. Uh, here he is chatting about the difficulties that he had trying to have a normal social life again after his career exploded in 1998. I feel as if I've conformed back into normal life, and I think <laughs> if that's the if mm. that's the right phrase. But I also feel as if I. I could live two lives. I could play up to the, you know, to the the, the star attraction. Let's say I mm. could cope with the pressure. I could sign a million autographs and you know and and do the fame thing. Mm. But I could also then there's a you know to get to Liverpool from my house you have to go through the Mersey Tunnel. As soon as I get through the tunnel, I used to feel right now I'm out the city. I'm out the I'm I'm out out my job yes. now. And now I'm a, a normal lad again with my mates, with my family and, and all the rest. But they say it's it's the the biggest problem for most footballers and the biggest reason they change, let's say, mm. is because of how people act towards and not how they are. That's very interesting. Uh, I could imagine it's very difficult to make genuine new friends outside of football. Oh, oh well I've got I've got one mate. I've got a lot of people that, you know, my brother's mates and, and a few people that I know and whatever, but I've got one mate mm. and yeah, that was the hardest thing that you can't really I mean my mate now and my uh, and my wife and my family are all laugh at me saying you now talk to more people I used to apparently I used to sit in the corners I used to go even if I went racing or something I'd sit in the in the corner and I'd mm. I'd be if anyone used to come up to me I would be very guarded and sort of short with them in a way not on purpose yeah and now they laugh at me saying I'll talk to anybody I go around and I'll I'm very very sociable I think I'm naturally sociable but mm. I was 
I couldn't be. I yeah, really interesting stuff from Michael Owen. Not the complete asshole that everybody had assumed he was, it turns out, at all. Uh, so you can dig that whole thing out. It's available on our YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash off the ball. Now, you'll notice that John Duggan is here to make us some money. I hope so, Jared. Cleena, good morning. Good morning. It's Punch's Town. Are you down there? Are you on your way right now? Is that where no, you're? No, I'm not. I'm, I'm doing another job until six o'clock this evening. So I might go down Friday, but we'll see how the week goes. Yeah. See how the week goes. You'll go down to celebrate and pick up your money, or you'll be going down to try and chase your losses. Uh, no, who knows? It could who knows, Jerry? I mean, look, we're we're at the moment that everything is like an aerial ultra ad. Everything's pristine. You know, there's no losers. There's no there's no hard luck stories yet. So right now we're we're smelling the roses, but it'll all change by tomorrow evening. Before we get into that, let's talk about the main story this week, and it's it's brilliant that this festival has this plot line because it focuses all of the average sports fans attention for like otherwise it's just a bunch of races and a bunch of different horses now we have these absolutely proper titans going head to head and we have uh, a clear favorite who's miles ahead who in the same circumstances last year got beaten yeah and that favorite is gordon elliott Jarrah, and you're right I mean, a lot of the time we Love to see the horse like Sprinter Sack coming over, or we did love to see a horse like Sizing John win three gold cups, which he did last year, completing that, that third one at Punches Town. But this is a brilliant story. This is a great sports story. And the prize money is over €3 million Euro this week. The, last year, Willie Mullins was 382000 down, and he ended up a couple of hundred thousand ahead to pip Gordon Elliott for the trainer's title and win it for, I think, the 10th year in a row. Gordon Elliott has never won it. Gordon Elliott has pipped Willie Mullins by a head in the Irish and English Grand Nationals. So this is just so set up. We have the whole uh, issue, the fact that Gigginstown has stood Michael O'Leary, uh, left Willie Mullins a couple of years ago. Most of his horses now are with Gordon Elliott, and that's the reason why Gordon Elliott is nearly there, but he's not there yet. Yeah. And we have, what, 12 grade ones this week, and Willie Mullins has got, for example, in the champion chase today. If he gets the first three in, the champion chase today it's worth 240 grand it could almost have Gordon Elliott's advantage in one race yeah. and it, a lot will depend on how things go over the next few days whether we'll see the champion horse really in terms of the future of Gordon Elliott's yard Sam Crow go against the big boys in the champion hurdle on Friday he might have to do that he might have no other choice but to do that if he's going to win this title and of all the 89 runners today 42 of them are trained by either Gordon Elliott oh. or Willie Mullins. So they're really throwing the kitchen sink. They're throwing everything at this, and it's fantastic. There'll be 125,000 people at Punchestown over the next five days. There'll be 64 million generated for the economy, and half the attendance will be female. So it's just a fascinating week and some great races as well. Because it used to be meaningless because Willie Mullins would have had it sewn up. Yeah, he would have. And that's the one of the consequences of that split with Gigginstown stud is that Gordon Elliott... It has just risen from nothing. I mean, remember when Silver Birch won the Grand National 11 years ago, he'd never had a winner in Ireland. And now he's had over 200 winners. Willie's never had over 200 winners. So Gordon has proven himself as a crack trainer. Willie is a brilliant trainer as well. And we just got, you know, just like every, after every race, we'll have these constant figures and we'll, we'll see by Saturday how it's going. I, but I was saying, John, um, Patrick Mullins, who's in The Independent, yes. does, does the column for them today. Um, he's saying that um, Gordon Elliott's yard, right, this year, uh, 1,175 runners, 302 horses, 206 winners. And he says, I'm reliably informed Hannibal crossed the Alps with less horses than that. Phenomenal numbers. It is, and just the, the, the amount of effort that goes in and the people that are all doing the work behind the scenes. Um, you know, uh, it's all, all these things. I'll talk about teams, and of course, these uh, guys have a real talent to what they do and the people, but they, they've got talented, very talented people around them. Um, and we, we've seen a soft ground... Cheltenham, a soft ground entry, and these horses are coming out again at Punchestown. You might get some shocks this week because of that, but the fact that they're able to train them for this week as well is a testament to them. There's 38 races this week. And, and um, how is the ground? The ground is yielding, so it's probably one of the best ground we've seen all winter. Yes, it's been uh, so bad. Yeah, it's been so bad and unusually bad, and I think that this will be the fastest ground that horses would have uh, run on uh, all winter, and that's another uh, intriguing subplot for this. So. Okay. Let's get, let's get to it. So the Champions Chase, you think that there's a possibility of a 1-2-3? There is, absolutely. So he's got Min, Ballycasey, Anderso and Duva. And, uh, yeah. Um, so when you, I'm not going to the batting here. Not bad. That's just, that's just Willie Mullins. Yeah, that's sport. just Willie Mullins. Duvan is the favourite. Min is the second favourite. And Anderso is the third favourite. Like, if you go by the odds, he'll, he'll, he'll get that 240 grand. 
of Gordon Elliott today in that for in that first but uh-huh. uh, the first big race 275,000 euro per day in the big race uh, and then we have another couple of grade ones we got the grow wise novice chase over three miles and we also have the herald champion novice hurdle over two miles which has mainly can of Gordon Elliott uh, versus get a bird of Willie Mullins so so many interesting plots today and and big owners and big egos and and Davy Russell and Davy Russell in the form of and life da- and, yeah. da- and Davy Russell actually I was looking you know the sub- they, all the papers have good supplements day the star the sun the Inda, um and Davy Russell does a column in the star and he actually Jack Kennedy goes from Mengley Khan obviously in that one in the novice hurdle and Davy Russell is has is saying have a punt on Paloma Blue there as well and that's for Henry de Bromhead who is another person that has got an interest this week, and he doesn't care about William Mullins or Gordon Elliott. He just no. wants to train horses. He's got Mona Lee in that feature, three mile novice chase. So, um, yeah, it's it's. It, I have to say the rate, quality of the racing is fantastic. Dick O'Sullivan and Punches Town they've done a tremendous job at making this a real standalone festival in itself, and I think the prize money's got a lot to do with that. Okay, so what are we looking at? So I think we're looking at. There's the three bets, you know, small bets I'd be recommending today. I think Duvan is even money for this champion chase, the ball sports champion chase at half five over two miles. This horse was the best horse in training before he got injured, Duvan. 14 out of 17 races he's won, nine over 11 over fences. Uh, he fell in the champion chase at Cheltenham when he was uh, going well, tanking along. And by all, if you read between the lines, he's working very well at home. If he retains any of the previous ability that he had, he, is one of the, he could be one of the best bets of all time at even money. Right now, Duvan, I think he's, I think he's a very good price. Duvan in that in that ball sports champion chase. I mean, Paul Tennant had the chance to ride Min. He had the chance to ride under so the second and third favourites. He's gone for Duvan. If Duvan, who hammered sizing John all through his novice career, twice a Cheltenham Festival winner, uh, retains that ability, he is a great bet at even money. People go, well, even money is not a great price, or hundred to one is a great price. This could be the best even money bet in a long time if he wins doing handstands, which I expect him to do today. Okay, so you think I think Duvan is is is, clear a, winner. is is a winner today. I think another winner is Mona Lee, the uh, the, the favourite for that three mile chase at 640, 15 to eight favourite for Henry de Bromhead is a fresh horse. So unlike some of the others, didn't go to Ferry House. Um, won earlier this season at Punchestown is a very good jumper. Only presenting Percy had the better of him at Cheltenham. He was seven lengths clear of the rest. Yeah, with album photo behind him. Uh, we had Duna Cost behind him in, in that race. Shattered Love was beaten at Ferry House. I think Mona Lee sets the standard. And once again, I think Henry de Bromhead is very happy with him. I think the ground will suit him. And I think he's a good jumper. And I think he's a very good bet. See, when you're uh, saying the win. ground is going to suit, sorry, when you're saying the ground is going to suit, how do we know? Because there's been no yielding ground all year. Like, is it based on form a year ago? And yeah, form a year ago um, w- would suggest a lot. Uh, Mon Lee ran well at Cheltenham on good ground last year. Um, and, and, and also what I'm taking into account, Jerry, is that, you know, Album Photo and, Sh- and, and Shattered Love have run twice now on soft ground within the space of, what, six weeks? So they should be knackered. Uh, that's what I'd be kind of thinking to myself. So I think Mon Lee, having bypassed Ferry House, is a fresher horse and also bypassed Aintree. And I think that he is a good jumper. Um, he's a pretty straightforward horse to me. Um, and I think he's, 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 he's a bet that I... And, and just interesting on that, Gordon Elliott has a column in um, Gordon Elliott has a column in the Sun, and he says that of all of his horses today, he reckons the Chattered Love is the one. Well, there you go. And that's that's the beauty of the game. It's all about opinions. He might be, and he knows a lot more than me about horses. Shattered Love eleven to two at this stage. Yeah, Shattered Love won really well. At, she's a mare. She won ran beautifully at Cheltenham and won. Um, the horse she beat at Cheltenham won very well at Aintree last time. I think it's Terrafor is the name of it. So the form has been franked, as it were. The form has worked out. But Manley has won a grade one, and um, as has obviously Shattered Love at Cheltenham. But Shattered Love got I was a little bit disappointed in her at Ferry House. And actually, he does say he does say in the next line, I love the mayor. And there is emotion sometimes her, yes, involved. Yeah, and sometimes yeah, they, 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 they have their yeah. favourites, exactly, yeah, yeah emotionally. Yeah, yeah. Um, the each way bet I like today in the 4.55, a 25-runner handicap hurdle. So not one to be doing your shirt on. At any way, not that you should do your shirt on anything, but there's a horse number 18 called Golden Spear. This is um, trained by Tony Marsh and fourth last time at Leopardstown, staying on well. Liam Quinlan, a 17 year old amateur who's going places, is in the saddle, taking seven pounds off the horse. He'll have about nine stone 11. This horse won a, a handicap, a big handicap at the Galway Festival a couple of years ago. He's won a November handicap on the flat at Leopardstown. I think he's a good each way, about a 12 to 1 Golden Spear in the 455. Okay, Golden Spear, uh, number 18 Golden Spear in the 455. 
Uh, I've had a bit of word for true self in that same race, around about 20 to 1. Will always be your true self, Ter. <laughs> um, there's a couple of bumpers. Once again, if, if I'll, be, I'll be wary, folks. There's a Goffsland Rover bumper. A lot of these horses haven't even seen a race course. We have Think Positive, who's a half-brother to Sam Crow for William Mullins. Uh, Commander of Fleet. Barry O'Neill is a very good point-to-point jockey. Anything he rides for Gordon Elliott over the week is worth following but no bet in this race no bet either in the last race another bumper I didn't like it in terms of you haven't really seen much of these horses run um, the other grade one the novice hurdle uh, get a bird to me is too short at even money um, Sharjah has been put up in the racing post as price wise today at 14 to 1 has not had his ground all season another Willie Mullins horse Sharjah might be I wouldn't put anybody off having a bet on him each way. Gordon Elias is very keen on Manly Khan if you read the comments and Paloma Blue is a horse I think is gonna go places, probably over fences. So it's not really a race to get involved yeah, in. That's it. when you're when you're like you, able to legitimately make a case for three or four and yes. like have the cracks it back Jack, and watch. Jack Kendi has a column in the star and um he he's he says he's a good book of rides on his fancy today would be Mangley Khan as well. Uh, uh, it's not a race to have a bet in for me. Neither is the first one out, which I think is between Blue Templar and Enniskillen. This is over the banks. Like the really cl- clearly Duvan stands out for me. Clearly Mon Lee stands out for me and an each way bet on Golden Spear. So I, I I don't think there's any need for me to do anything more than that. Fair enough. John, good stuff. Thanks right, very much Jared, for that. Cleaner. Thanks, John. Happy punting. Yeah, and uh, John's going to be with us every day this week? Yes. Yeah, okay, so we'll have, we'll have winners every day. Now, how did your golf betting go at the weekend? Did you, did you even see my Twitter? Did I, you? I saw a bit of your tweet, that's why I brought it up. So Andrew Landry is this guy who's had a kid, um, and there's this kind of theory in golf called the nappy factor, uh, when, when especially about uh, firstborn sons. Um, when golfers have just, you know, because it's such a mental game, they've given birth and they, they, they don't worry, they don't have to worry about, you know, they're not worried about golf. Golf is just, is completely incidental now to the great, uh, having a child, your firstborn. And he had, a, I think he had a son recently. Uh, he missed four cuts in a row. Uh, I read all about this and I backed him last week in the tournament at Hilton Head. He played well for three rounds, was in contention, and then had a really bad final round. But I traded him, which is the thing where I didn't actually even back him each way. I traded him at 380 to one on Betfair. Um, in the hope that he might contend, get to 10 to 1, and then I lay off the money and get a bit of a profit. Uh, he didn't do anything. I left it alone last week and he won 150 to 1. <laughs> so <laughs> you can get, like, it's, like it's, it's very difficult to get them on the right week. Uh, and you can, the you can spot them. And there's a tipster called Ben Coley in the Sporting Life who did, well, fair play to him, spot him and got him at 200 to 1. But I've always said, folks, Golf is where the money is, and we're going to prove that on Off the Ball over the next 12 months. You just have to stay stay at it. <laughs> stay loyal. OTB AM is brought to you this morning with Air, the home of Air Sports. Get amazing live sporting content free with Air Broadband. Right, so as we said, we're talking Liverpool Roma next. As we mentioned, Ian Rush was also in town yesterday. Here he is on the prospect of Mo Salah beating the Ian Rush goal record for Liverpool. Oh, he's been absolutely amazing. You know, he's been a joy to watch and he's got better and better. Uh, for me, uh, you know, people say it's about the record and all that. If he breaks it, good luck to him. You know, I'd love to see him score, you know, break that record in, the, in you know, the European Champions League final. No, I wouldn't mind. I'd be happy if he'd done that. But at the end of the day, he's had an absolutely amazing season and uh, hopefully he can get even better. You know, uh, the Liverpool uh, supporters love him. He, lo- he loves the, the supporters, you know, the club love him and everyone loves him and he's so humble, you know, that's the thing about it and uh, hopefully, you know, he keeps himself fit and hopefully uh, there's not five, he has six games to, to try and break that now. I think a lot of people felt, you know, when Luis Suarez left, the 31 Premier League goals would be difficult to do again. Did you ever think Liverpool would find a forward of that quality again? Uh, difficult because I've seen uh, in the first season I've seen uh, I've only seen two players uh, Fernando Torres and, and Luis Suarez you know they were absolutely incredible in their first season but I could get, most probably go as far to say as uh, Salah's most probably beaten that you know he's been absolutely amazing right from the start he's been uh, he's incredible uh, you know he, he makes the goals as well as score goals and all that so uh, I know I'm putting a bit of pressure on him and all that now but uh, you know when I seen uh, Torres and, and Suarez in their first season they were absolutely amazing but I think Salah could have been Top yeah, so Ian Rush there, obviously, at the launch of the Liverpool Napoli friendly in the Aviva, uh, talking about the game tonight and just how amazing Mo Salah is. A couple of quick comments for you before we get to our preview of the match tonight. Kelvin McCallion says, Keith Earls has become one of Ireland's most consistent players and must be one of the first names on the team sheet. And Neil Keegan says, Earls, 112 years old and getting better, what an example. <laughs> He's only 30, isn't he? <laughs> yeah, but he's been around so long and he's done so much as well. He's, yeah. con- he's in constant motion for most of that time. 
Uh, Henry Martin on Twitter says, Carlo have made serious progress and next thing they lose one of their best players for the summer. It is a blow to Turlock O'Brien, hashtag OTBAM. And also using the hashtag OTBAM this morning is Dervil O'Rourke who says, great to listen to Cleaner first thing on a Tuesday morning. Give me the... Pony, Foley, Foley. Pony, Pony Yellow is my th- is my Twitter handle. I just realised it's Foley Pony. backwards. It is indeed, yes. <laughs> Pony forwards, Pony, Foley backwards. Pony forwards okay, forwards. right, okay, I get it now. <laughs> we had um, uh, yeah, Johnny Ward in yesterday who I was always like, is it something to do with Man He's City? He's what is really strange. It's Irish, is it? It's uh, the ancient Irish kingdom. Yeah, I couldn't figure his, his Twitter handle out for a long time. That's yeah, what it is. I always read it as Uwe Maine, like something yeah. to do with Uwe Ross. <laughs> I thought it had been to college in America or Man something City weird. Or something. <laughs> Maine, yeah, Maine. That would have been more like it's uh, Uwe Mania. It's uh, Os- Osgoelga, apparently. It. Or maybe it's ancient Irish. I don't even know. Uh, right, let's move on. We've got um, Simon Hughes on the line to help us to preview tonight's massive game between Liverpool and Roma. Simon, we'll talk about the current game itself. But like these clubs have a, a proper European history. Um, the European Cup final that they played in is a is a storied match for what happened on the field. It's also unfortunately a, a match that had repercussions off the field for all sorts of reasons. Yeah, um, I mean, in many ways, I think this game is, is probably the more interesting semi final and Real Madrid and and, um, and Bayern Munich. Because it, it does, you know, bear so much weight of history. I think if you if you look back to 1984 when Roma last got to the European Cup final, as it was then, you know, it was it was a final that was played in their home city um, for the, their first European Cup final, which they lost. Um, for Liverpool, you know, Liverpool were a very successful European dominant force at that time, and we're, we're, it wasn't necessarily surprised that Liverpool went there and won. But when you actually look at the set of circumstances behind the, the match itself um, and the atmosphere for Liverpool to go and win there was, was pretty spectacular really um, I mean you know it, it was it was an away game I mean I know Chelsea went to Munich in the 2012 and won uh, but the world was a, a little bit different in, in 1984 compared to 2012 I think um, so yeah I mean obviously before the game Liverpool supporters were subjected to um you know, quite a few difficulties on entering the city. Uh, there was, you know, stabbings and slashings and and, and, and so on. Um, and then during the game and after the game, it continued. So at that time, you know, that the game didn't get, uh, sorry, sorry, the violence and, and problems around the game didn't get as much coverage in the in the British press as it did in the Italian press. Um, but, you know, I think the focus really tonight is the football. I mean, I know memories live long and everything else. Um, but you know both clubs have been starved of European success for for you know different amounts of time, but relatively long periods of time. And you know I think I think there's just you know this absolute desire you know from both clubs to to try and get through. Just a, a, one final point on the '84 game. Um, there's that legendary story about the Liverpool players um, in the tunnel. They they kind of start clicking their their feet and the studs on the. Um, on the concrete, start making a noise, and they realise that it's this, the same rhythm of a song, and they start singing. And it turns out, uh, Cleaner was saying it's a uh, Chris Rea song. Chris Rea song, yeah. Correct, yeah. Um, and I, I kind of always wondered. It's like, well, it, but this is like one of the greatest football teams of all time. Why would they have felt the need to not be intimidated? And ultimately, the game is only a draw. But you make a really excellent point. It was an away match. Mm. I think it just summed up the, the 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 attitude of the Liverpool team at the time and the kind of the dynamic and the relationship between the players. I mean, they, they were standing there in the tunnel waiting to go out, you know, amidst. You know, I was speaking to to David Hodgson, who was a substitute that night, and uh, he was right at the back of the tunnel, and he, he couldn't actually see outside. It was just the smoke was was billowing into the tunnel. Um, and you know, he, he, Liverpool players could sense that the Roma players were very nervous. Obviously that. It was a game in the home city for all the reasons that I explained. You know, the pressure was all on them, despite them really, in, in a sporting sense, being underdogs, I guess. Um, you know, and, and David Hodgson claimed that it was his idea. And anyway, he was the first one that started singing the Chris Rea song. <laughs> it's just totally unnerved all the Roma players. They were like, you know, how how can you... You know, they were like, why are they singing this this unusual pop song? Um, and, and, you know, it calmed Liverpool, the Liverpool players down. And it, there's a great image of... Graeme Souness leading the team out with with Bruce Grob. Souness, you know, has a steely 
determination and, and you know if you look at his face you, you know that Liverpool aren't going to lose the game but then meanwhile they've got Bruce Grobelar behind who, who's just laughing at the whole scene it's just surreal you know if Liverpool were to lose that game and do the same thing now you know I, th- I think people would be accusing them of unprofessionalism but that's just the way that Liverpool team was you know with the characters and kind of the inner belief and the way they dealt with these sort of challenges the the characters and the inner belief of the current team at the very top of that tree is Jurgen Klopp. He's kind of he has been every inch the messianic leader that the club thought he would potentially become, and he has fully lived up to the the pre arrival hype and has overcome some minor difficulties along the way to definitely reach a point now where he has a symbiosis with the club. Yeah, I mean, I, I think. I think I think he still has to deliver something, you know, palpable in terms of, you know, winning a trophy. Um, but, you know, for me, I, you know, I've realised this season, you know, that, that, that on a personal level, you know, football really is is a lot about hope. You know, just that hope that you can you can actually achieve something. I mean, Liverpool have tra- travelled a long way in a short period of time under Jurgen Klopp. It's easy to forget that they got to a Europa League final his first season. Um, I think there's been a bit change in his approach since then. I think, you know, listening to him going to the press conferences, listening to him talk in that period two years ago, I think he was just kind of, you know, he was accepting that this wasn't his Liverpool team yet. Um, you know, anything, you know, any sort of progression it was a bonus really, whereas now you listen to him talk and I think you genuinely sense that he believes now that this team is capable of doing some special things, you know, and if Liverpool were to, to beat Roma, I mean, I think Roma are a very good team and I think it's going to be much harder for Liverpool to um, to get through than some people think. I mean, they haven't conceded a goal at home in Europe all season. They've, um, you know, they, they played some top quality opposition, Atletico Madrid, Chelsea, Barcelona, Shakhtar Donetsk, all teams that can, you know, on their day put two or three past any opposition. So they clearly got, you know, the, the right idea defensively. But um, across two legs, I just, I just, you know, the, the, the forward line that he's assembled, Jurgen Klopp, I, I just don't see how it doesn't score enough goals to get through. Um, I think it's a slightly different European scene to what Liverpool exited in, in 2008-9, uh, sorry, 9-10, when, you know, a lot of the football uh, Champions League winners were kind of often the, the best defensive team I think now it's the most attacking team and Liverpool really are in the top two or three attacking teams in, in, in Europe I think at this moment um, I know people say there's question marks over the defence after West Brom but you know there, there, there were quite a few changes made there I think um, you know they, they'll be back to full strength tonight and yeah, I think uh, he's totally given the City yeah, and Klopp that belief again that, that anything is possible that's the thing about being a football fan, being a sports fan, really, that we all need a little bit of um, a sense that we're not wasting our time here, that we're not watching. It's a great It's a great line. That's a great line. Football is about hope. Sport is about hope. Yeah, that's why we love it. Mm, absolutely. <laughs> um, Simon, what's going to happen? What, what do you expect to be the... Uh, they're going to score more goals and uh, roam over the two legs. We've been reading a lot about how familiar Mo Salah will be to the opposition and how they're going to physically target him Club's like, yeah, go ahead, and then he'll punish you in the, in the football sense. Um, yeah. what, what's going to happen? How will this game tactically play out? Well, it, it's an intriguing game. It really is an intriguing game, I think, because, you know, um, you know we, we like to bracket teams from different nations in a certain way, and everybody says, well, you know, Roma, Italian team, they're going to know how to defend. Um, well, so I don't think they've actually got any Italian defenders in, in the defence at the moment. You know, they're made up of, of Brazilians and Serbians and uh, a Greek, you know, a Greek defender, um, and obviously they've got an Italian manager who, who's who's quite inexperienced at this level. You know, this is a, a new territory for for Di Francesco, the the Roma manager, where which is where I think Klopp has the advantage. You know, I think he, he's obviously been in these situations over the over the years. Um, but you know, that says I actually think you know if you look further up the pitch, Roma have a little bit more experience than Liverpool. Um, you know. Somebody like Daniel De Rossi has played in, you know, big European matches, big, um, big international matches over the years. You know, they, they do have, you know, a, a, 
you know, quite a, a lot of experience out the team. So it's an interesting, you know, they're both at different stages. I think the Roma is slightly, you know, as I've mentioned before, you know, the defensive record is is um, is, is impressive. Liverpool are an attacking team. Um, ultimately, I, I just think that Liverpool, you know, if if Liverpool can get a first leg lead, um, you know, of any kind, not even even though the Roma have knocked out uh, Barcelona and Shakhtar over two legs, haven't scored a um, you know an away goal, which was crucial in, in both legs. I just think if Liverpool take any lead to Roma, I think I think it's going to be very difficult for Roma, as Man City found out. To, to kind of claw that back because Liverpool's counter-attacking abilities are so devastating. Um, of course, you know, there, there are other issues, you know, keeping 11 men on the pitch. I think that could be, de- de, you know, uh, decisive as well. I mean, that, that's one thing that Liverpool haven't had to had to deal with t- too often this season. But when, obviously, when they played Manchester City at the start of the season, they got a player sent off and the way they play, they do need a full 11 men on the pitch. So I think over two legs, that, that sort of... Uh, small, relatively small detail could be could be key. Two last things I wanted to ask you about. One was um, Coutinho, the most expensive sub in the world, and how Klopp apparently was absolutely thrilled when Barcelona came in and made such a, an offer for Coutinho because he kind of had apparently decided that Coutinho didn't really have a role in his starting eleven. Is this true? Is this post event mm. rationalization where he's like, ah, look, my life is brilliant. That was the best gamble yeah. I ever made. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't think it's quite. To that level, I mean, I think that the Klopp recognised last summer, you know, with with the players, uh, you know, in Mane, he they, they wanted Mane, Firmino, and Salah to be the, the front three. You know, over the last two or three, four years, Coutinho has been one of those front three members. And you know, at the start of the season, uh, he, he he doctored his position slightly, although he had played in midfield more often towards the end of last season on, on occasion in some big games over the previous couple of years, but. You know, I, I just think that the Klopp, you know, when when he knows a player isn't with him, I think it's quite difficult for him to kind of rationalise how you know to, how to how to stay with him in many ways. You know, and I don't think he, he was desperate for him to go, but I think he accepted. Well, if he wants to go, I'll find a solution. You know, around this, and I think that's what separates him from previous Liverpool managers. You know, he he finds solutions where other managers don't, and he certainly done that. You know, he who would have said that this midfield. That Liverpool have would 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 be capable of not only um, you know supplying the chances for you know the, the number of chances that have actually increased you know for, for the for the forward line since Coutinho's left. So you know he, he's he finds solutions, Klopp, and I think that's why people you know people relate to him and he, he doesn't feel sorry for himself. You know he's in control of every situation. <coughs> um, it's certainly not like kind of. You know, trying to be smart after the event. I think from Klopp, I think Klopp, if he has his way, would have would have wanted to keep him because clearly he's a very talented player, and you know, managers don't want to sell talented players. But ultimately, uh, he's found a way around it, and you know, they, they haven't really missed him at all. No, and you get the Virgil Van Dijk money in cash. You know, brings Allied truck. Thanks very much from Barcelona, and you go and spend it. And I think the team is much better for having Van Dijk in it. One last thing I wanted to, to talk to you about was um, the story of the Roma player Agostino Di Bartolome, who I know you've, you've been writing about. This is a, another tragic adjunct to the 1984 game. Yeah, well, I, I think it's, um, it just emphasises just, again, you know, how, how big a game that, that, that particular match was for Roma. I mean, it, uh, Di Bartolome was... The Rome captain from Rome playing the European final as his home city. Home city. Um, within 12 months, he'd, he'd actually left Roma, uh, went up to sign for Milan. Um, you know, there was a fallout after that final. You know, whispers of rumours about um, certain players not wanting to take penalties in the shootout. You know, he supposedly this had been confirmed, but, but, but fell out with one or two players, and this this um, led to the departure from his hometown club. Anyway. Obviously, ten years later, um, on the very date, on the anniversary of the the game in Rome, he he, um, he killed himself. Um, and you know, a, a lot of people have written about this in Italy. And you know, the, the the general consensus is, you know, that it's not insignificant that he 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 chose that particular date, although he had other problems at that time. So, you know, it's a very sad story. You know, one that that you know, I know people in Rome kind of it still lingers on why um but you know it it just it just shows you that the, the impact of football and how 
how important people view it and, and how people you know react to it when when defeats like this happen. I mean, ultimately, you know, Bill Shankly said it is more than life and death, but it, it isn't really, if, if, we're, if we're being honest. Yeah, no, for sure. Simon, great stuff. Thanks very much for joining us this morning. Thank you. Yeah, and we'll treat, tweet out the links to the uh, pieces that Simon Hughes has written if you want to read more Great about pieces, that story. Really good, really good stuff. Uh, it, I, frequently, um, I don't know if you saw the whole blind boy Conor McGregor interaction through the DMs, but um, like uh, we were making the point after that that you do forget that uh, even Conor McGregor is a human being underneath all the stuff that we read about in the newspapers, but certainly like the Rome captain in 1984. Yeah, and, and Simon had a great quote um, from him in that piece, and he said, uh, quote, the quote was that he had struggled to find space in the world of football, which I thought was a really interesting line. Yeah, full of the good lines there, Simon, this morning, actually. Mm, um, this game is going to be pretty exciting. Yeah, um, and I, what struck me reading it then, um, reading about it, the history of it then, was a couple of things. And one was the fan violence and the terrorist violence and the aggression and just, I mean, literally uh, English fans, Liverpool fans were stabbed and there was incredible stuff happened. And thank God that football is a safer place now. Now, it's interesting that um, Liverpool uh, club has come out and said, you know, he doesn't want, uh, he wants he wants them to be welcomed. And apparently they've laid on, which may, not, may or may not be a good idea, a, um, a band at the airport, you know, those little ukulele band at the airport to welcome the <laughs> to welcome the Italian fans. I'm not so sure that's a good idea, but um, Our traditional yeah, that's yes, yeah, that's stressing um, because of the Man City recently, of course, as well. Because I, it is it is worrying to see any ugly violence and the thought that it could come back again, given yeah. what what the and 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 Heisel was a year later after that European and not unconnected by all accounts. Yeah, well, and with the, with the situation with Liverpool and Italian fans again, yeah. Yeah. Um, it, it struck me reading it was that how acceptable the whole thing was. It was like the English press didn't really write about they it that much. They didn't write about like, the Italian press. Wrote about yeah. it, he was saying, yeah, exactly. Which was a bit weird. Yeah, but very strange. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I don't know why that was. Um, and there was some inference as well in a piece I read that um, that Dun did Dundee lose the semi final to Roma, and that there's some inference that that they that the referee was got at right. for that game. So there's an incredible history yeah. with Roma and the European Cup and now this game as well. And Certainly suppose, it's believable that uh, referees were got at by Italian clubs uh, during that period of time. I mean, yes. yeah. yeah. All right, good stuff. Kleena, thanks for joining us today. Thank you. Hope you enjoyed it. I did indeed. Um, and we'll have uh, Maura Trasini Cali in tomorrow and then on... Thursday, I can't even remember. Quinny's going to be in on Thursday, yes. Yeah. So we have a busy week for you here on OTB AM as um, Owen Sheehan continues his uh, journey around some of the great sporting artefacts of uh, America. Final few comments for you. Uh, Shlomo Ben Gerson says, I became a Liverpool fan because I saw Michael Owen score for England against Argentina in the 1998 World Cup. My family weren't football fans. My nephews are Liverpool fans because their dad is a Liverpool fan, though. So, <laughs> yeah, you're passing on the disease. Slash uh, love, hashtag OTBAM. Um, Chris Suley says the key is Milner, Henderson and Van Dyke stopping Roma scoring. I mean, that's true. If Roma don't score tonight, then you'd have to make Liverpool favourites to uh, go through no matter what happens. Uh, Paul Lavery said Toddy spoke on his retirement about the same fears after he finished playing, how he would find a space in the world. Um, you hope that Toddy has managed somehow to... Uh, live a second life as full and as exciting as his first life. So tonight, live and off the wall, Kevin Caban is at Anfield. He'll be talking about Liverpool and Roma. Dublin hurler Conal Keeney is in studio to talk about his dual life as a footballer, a hurler, and uh, what he's doing with the rest of his life. And then tomorrow morning, out to be AM, we'll have reactions to Liverpool, Roma, and build up to Real Madrid against Bayern Munich. We'll also be talking all the latest in GA and rugby as well. And uh, <clears throat> you can get us everything today across offtheball.com. Cheers. OTB AM in association with Air. Get Air Sport free with Air Broadband.